John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Good morning. Um, hey, I haven't done this in a while, but there's enough new people. I, I feel it is worth saying again. Uh, our church name is Tov. Uh, we're not a cult. I know it's an odd word, uh, but the word is a Hebrew word. It comes from Genesis. God creates everything. He looks at his work and he says, man, this is very good or, or Tov. And that word literally means it's good. It's beautiful and that things are operating in a way that things should operate. And hear me, that's been Mari and I's prayer since before day one is for sure. We do not have a perfect church. We for sure have our flaws, but by the grace of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we want to endeavor to have a church that is operating in the way that a church should operate. Amen. And our mission has never changed. It is to lead everybody to the person, not the idea, not the theology, not the historical figure, but the person who's still alive to Jesus and to love everybody like Jesus. Amen? And so we are still in the gospel according to Matthew. We've been in this book. Uh, I, I checked. We started Matthew in September 2022. So come September, we'll be in this book for two years. Give yourself a hand for bearing this out with me. We love the Bible. We believe every letter, every dot, every tittle, every iota is there for a reason. We believe all of it is good for encouraging, for teaching, for rebuking, for correction. Amen? Amen. And so we are in Matthew. We'll be done September at some point, I promise, before we start the most controversial series we've ever done in the history of our church called Reclaim, 10 Rods of Truth in a Raging world. So we'll be in Matthew chapter 22. Hear me, we are coming upon that season where people are getting married. Anybody getting married soon? I know we got awesome. That's awesome. I love weddings. I love going to them. I love doing them because for me, you get a little taste of heaven of a, of a groom going for his bride. Uh, but this wedding today, it's a little different uh, unlike today, weddings back then weren't just one day. It was a seven-day party. Just so you know, heaven is going to be a party. So if you can't take a joke, if you can't laugh, if you are more serious than Jesus, number one, scoot over a little bit, or number two, you're going to hate heaven. Heaven's going to be a party. It was a seven-day feast, and this was also, it was a royal wedding. It was for a king's son, right? Um, but unlike other weddings, this wedding was unique in the sense of it did involve a king and his son, but it also involved some ornery, ungrateful invitees. It involved a kidnapping, a murder, and arson. No big deal. So, Matthew 22, verse 1 through 7, let's start there. This is the word of God. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables. Parabole, again, a parable is when you cast something alongside something else, it is an earthly story with a deep, deep, profound truth. Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast, verse 5, but they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city, right? Uh, ungrateful invitees, arson, kidnapping, and murder. It sounds like a crazy wedding. And, and we're calling this message Wedding Crashers, not the movie, but the sermon, right? And as you read this parable, you'll notice the king gives a twofold invitation. Number one, in advance, he sends his servants 
to these people to invite them to this feast. This is not a, uh, an, an email or a, or a mail. This was personal invitation face-to-face -face as ambassadors of the king. Hey, we like to our king would like to invite you to this feast. Invitation number two, once the feast was ready and the, and the animals have been slaughtered, it was all ready, then come, dinner is served. Two-fold invitation. But verse five, but they paid no attention and they went off. One to his farm, another to his business. They made light of the invitation. They paid no attention to the invitation because, hear me, they were just too busy. With their form, with their business, X, Y, Z, here is how it applies to you and me. Some of you, you are just too busy. And the Lord's been trying to invite you to get your attention, to wake you up, but you are just too busy with business, with your form, with X, Y, and Z. And hear me, if you are too busy for the Lord, you're just too busy. If you are too busy for the Lord, you are simply just too busy. And let me give a word to you parents with kids who are in sports. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, this was true in Ohio, this is true here. Uh, sports for kids have become a functional Jesus for people. And parents, hear me. If you do not make church and the things of God a priority, in your actions, in your calendar, with your bank account, with your life. Don't be surprised when your kids get older, they want nothing to do with church. Right? Um, I see this too often, parents, and for some of you, your kids really, it's not really about them with sports, it's about you, uh, and your kid is just a proverbial trophy for you to wave to all of your friends. Um, and it's an issue. It's an issue. Right. Um, a word to the dads, uh, men who have kids or you will have kids. Um, hear me. We start listing off job description titles for a pastor. Uh, let's, just, let's just try. So a pastor should be uh, protecting, right, the sheep. Uh, guiding, feeding, loving, nurturing, instructing, correcting, all of those applies to you dads and you men. Hear me, your children, they do have a primary pastor. It's not me, it is you. It's you. And so parents, hear me, your child's spiritual temperature um, it's not our responsibility at Tove Church. It's yours. And hopefully all we are doing for about an hour on a Sunday is just reinforcing what you've been teaching them Monday through Saturday. Because it, it just irritates me when I have parents of kids and more youth when their kids go off and they go wayward, they blame the youth pastor. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's on you. And hear me, I know that we don't save our kids. Please don't hear me that way. But man, it does matter what we do and how we act. Some of you, you've taught your kids how to throw a ball, but you've never taught them how to read God's word. Um, legacy matters, friends. Um, and some of you are too busy, and the Lord's been inviting you, trying to wake you up, for whatever that is, hey, your priorities are out of whack. You got to stop this. Like this bad has to stop so some good can start. There. He's been trying to invite you, but you've just been too busy. And like these guys, you paid no attention and you went off to your thing. How's it going, friends? What is the Lord trying to teach you, tell you, but you've just been too busy? Um. Hear me, it's not just what you do, it is also where you sow. It's not just what you do, it is also where you sow. Yes, your business may be thriving, but you've killed your marriage in the process. 
Your kids, they did get into that school. They did get on that team, but you never taught them about Jesus. You have more degrees than Fahrenheit, but you've learned that is not the same thing as wisdom. You are financially and materially, you are wealthy, but spiritually and relationally absolutely bankrupt. You've watched all 24 seasons of blank, but you've never learned to love talking to your father, a.k.a. prayer. It's not just what you do, it's where you sow. And if you want to know where you're sowing, check your calendar, check your bank account. This gets very practical, friends. If you're too busy for the Lord, you're just simply too busy, period. So let me ask it again. What bad or what foolish or what dumb things in your life has to stop so good can start. If you want something that you've never had, you got to do things that you've never done. Some of you, you want all of these things to happen, but you've changed nothing. That is a definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, expecting different results. What are you sowing into? What are you sowing into? He goes on, verse 6 and 7, right? We read this. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them, the king got angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned down their city, right? So some servants were ignored. The other servants were kidnapped and killed. If I had to choose, I'd probably choose the ignored crowd, right? Some were ignored, some were kidnapped, treated shamefully, and murdered. So the king got furious and sent his people to destroy these murderers and burn their city, okay? Um, The servants, of course, in this parable, these are the prophets that God has sent through the years in the Old Testament prophet after prophet to the nation of Israel to get their attention. Wake up. Your way and God's way are at odds. And just so you know, God's right and you're wrong. Prophets, again, they're not getting hugs. They're getting stones. Because they go in and they are preaching with clarity, with boldness, And they're preaching repentance, which is never a popular message even today to preach. Even though Romans says it's God's kindness that leads you to repentance. But they're going in, prophet after prophet, trying to get the attention of a nation. But they just keep on rejecting him, ignoring him. And for most of these prophets, it didn't end well, right? Isaiah got sawn in two. He was martyred. Jeremiah, stoned to death, martyred. Ezekiel, martyred. Habakkuk, martyred. Amos, martyred. Zechariah, martyred. It didn't go well. And as you know, the pattern of God was that in the New Testament, he would go to the Jews first and then also to the Gentiles. That's all of us. Let me read you something. This is from Stephen in Acts Stephen, before he got stoned, not not stoned, but stoned, 51 verse 52, before he dies, he says to these religious people, it's a great start, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and your ears, what does it say? You always resist the Holy Spirit. Here's a kicker. As your fathers did, so do you. Nothing has changed. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Stephen is saying, you guys, you're following a long legacy of people who have resisted, who have rejected the Holy Spirit. You always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Like father, like what? 
like son, you're doing the same thing. Some of you, this is your story. This is your legacy. You also come from a long legacy of generation after generation of people who have resisted God, who don't love Jesus, generation after generation of people who have rejected the Lord's invitation, generation after generation of sin and folly and destruction. And my prayer is, is that ends with you. Amen. That's the prayer. That after you, there will be generation after generation of people who love Jesus. Generation after generation of people who follow Jesus. Generation after generation of people of faithfulness and fruitfulness. Amen. That's the prayer. This is why I harp on legacy thinking, legacy living is not about just you and your marriage and your kids. It's about everybody that comes after you. Stephen says it. Just like your fathers did, you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same thing. Generation after generation. Some of you, you come from that legacy of just rebellion, foolishness, rebellion and you may be the first person in your messed up lineage with your last name that is following Jesus, loving Jesus, being faithful to Jesus. That's my story. Let me just ask, how many of you guys come from a broken lineage like that? Okay. As you raise your hands, I want you to feel the weight of that opportunity of you being the change in that lineage, amen? This is massive, friends. Um, That after you, it would be generation after generation of people who love Jesus because of what you have started, maybe even today. How many of you come from a lineage, not perfection, but a lineage of faithfulness to Jesus? Amen. Look at that. That's awesome. That's what I want my kids and my great, 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 great grandkids to raise their hands. Like, yep, I come from a lineage of faithfulness, not perfection, but of faithfulness to Jesus. And you get this opportunity to continue on this rich, faithful legacy. But this is so critical, friends. This is why I always say, when you just live for a great time, Usually, I've seen this, it is at the expense of a great legacy. But if you live for a great legacy, hear me, you'll have a great time along the way. It's awesome. It's joyful. The Christian life, following Jesus, is the most joyful, fun thing to do. Don't let any religious grumpy man tell you otherwise. Okay? Um, Then the parable says, right, it says the king got furious and he burned up the city. This also is predicting, it's that prophetic prediction of the temple of Jeru- in Jerusalem being destroyed in 70 AD. Okay. Uh, but let me say this, we, we read stuff like this, like the king got angry. Uh, can God get angry? Yes, religious people, they tend to put emotions in two buckets, good ones and bad ones. God had all the ones, but he used them righteously. He used them righteously. But we read like God, the king got angry and he sent his troops to, to destroy the murderers and to, to burn down their city. And our first thought is God seems very harsh and dramatic and mean. And I'm like, no, God seems very patient to me. He seems very patient to me. Like you think about, you just try, try your best to put yourself in God's position And that alone should make us feel uncomfortable. But you think of rebellion after rebellion after generation after generation. After you sent prophet after prophet, idol after idol, spiritual adultery after spiritual adultery. I'm surprised God hasn't made them kindling yesterday. But he is patient. And his wick is very long. And he's he's sending trying to send these prophets to get their attention. But at some point, friends, that wick will burn out. And that day is called Judgment Day. And make no mistake, all of us, whether you're a Christian or not, all of us are going to give an account to, not to a mirror, 
but to the Lord of lords and to the King of kings. And the Lord will not be mocked. He came the first time in humility. He will come again in absolute glory. But the day will come. Okay. Verse 8 through 10. Then he said to his servants, Hey, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited, they're not worthy. So go to the main roads, invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Get anybody, get Joe Schmo, get everybody who will say yes to this invite, to this feast. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Could you imagine just the, the, the visual layout of everybody that was there? Just, just the weird bricks in that house. Just get anybody, like get whoever, and whoever says yes, invite them to this feast, and it was packed. It was filled with guests. So uh, just to be clear, when we read any parable, you got to identify who these characters are. So in this one, the king in this parable is the God of the universe. The son in this parable is Jesus Christ. Those invited first were the Jewish people, and the Jews, if you know the story, they've been told, they've been taught, they've gone to school about the Messiah for centuries. Messiah comes, they don't believe him, they reject him, so there's judgment, so Jesus starts inviting those people. The people that the religious people would find irredeemable, he invites them. Verse 11 through 14. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are cold, but few are chosen. It seems a little harsh. It's like, hey, you invited me, and now you're throwing me into hell. Interesting. So hear me. The king here, he wants a lot of guests for his son. Jesus wants, hear me, God wants a ton of people. That's why we're here, to get people into heaven. Amen. Amen. That's why we're here, to tell people about Jesus, to set captives free. That's why we're here. Right? We want to make sure em- hell is emptier and heaven is fuller. That's why we're here. This is why we preach the gospel. This is why we're not ashamed of the gospel. This is why we preach the Bible verse by verse so people could be saved. Amen. He says, get anybody, get everybody. And naturally in doing so, with no time to prepare, nobody is going to be dressed properly for this wedding. It's like the guy that goes to a funeral with flip-flops and shorts, right? It was a last-minute invite, so no one's ready. So they go into this wedding, and they're not dressed. And hear me, the king, knowing that nobody would be dressed right, the king provided the clothes for the invitees. But there is that one guy. He's the wedding crasher. Don't be that guy that didn't have the wedding garment on. This guy essentially saying, hey, I don't need the king's garment. I can get in with what I have on. This is good enough. It's Gucci. To that person, the king says, find him, cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place is called hell, and hell is real, and forever is a long time. So this is somebody, hear me, who is formally attached to Jesus. I was baptized when I was one. I know all the Christian songs. I did the catechisms. I did this, but hear me, there is no inward change. This person, this wedding crasher, is the person that's trusting in their own righteousness other than Christ's righteousness. He's saying, this is good enough. 
This is clean enough. This is wrinkle free. This is a good brand. I think I can get in with what I have on. I don't think I need the king's garment. Thank you very much, but I think I'm good. Paul says it this way in Romans 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Here it is. For I bear them witness that, yes, they do have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Isaiah says that your good works, your own righteousness is as filthy rags. The original language, it literally means a bloody female menstrual cloth. He's saying it is disgusting. It is gross for you to think that your garments, your righteousness is good enough to get into the kingdom. That's what he's saying. That I am good the way that I am. I'm a good person. I am spiritual. I am moral. I am generous. I donate to charities. I've read the Bible twice. I know all the songs. I was baptized when I was one. X, Y, Z. I think I am good enough to get into him. He says, that's hell. Okay. Hear me. Your good deeds alone will send you to hell. Your morality alone will send you to hell. Your religious devotion alone will send you to hell. Your piety alone will send you to hell. Your spirituality alone will send you to hell. Everything else, everybody else, any other religion, any other spirituality apart from Jesus that, that includes Mormonism, that includes Jehovah's Witness, anything apart from Jesus will send you to hell. It's not very loving. I know, but it's true. So I believe it's the most loving thing I can tell you, friends. Because some of you are operating like this wedding crasher. You have the nicest garment on, but that garment alone will send you directly to hell. That's what he's saying here. That's who the wedding crasher is. It's somebody that's relying on their own self-righteousness. Okay. And hear me, there's a ton of that in Pittsburgh. I remember at a coffee shop about six months ago, um, I was eavesdropping. I didn't mean to, but it, I was just forced to because the conversation was so interesting. Um, <laughs> two gals, probably in their 30s, 40s, um, and all, I don't know the context. All I heard was one gal tell the other gal, yeah, I have not been to church since COVID, but I know I'm good because I was baptized when I was an infant. And I thought to myself, I was like, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm kidding. That's horrible. It's a joke, okay? Um, but I thought to myself, only if it were that easy, you just check that box and you are good. When there's no affection, there's no inward change, there's no fruit, but you're relying on you getting wet as a baby to get you in. Um, your self-righteousness. And some of you, you're so self-righteous. Right? You don't need the Holy Spirit because you are the Holy Spirit. Right? Verse 14. Here's how he ends it. He says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Okay, Th this, is a, this is a grenade with the pimpled issue, okay? Many are called, but a few are chosen. And hear me, we don't have enough time to go into this doctrine of election deeply. And even if we did, let me submit to you, we still want to understand this with our three-pound fallen brains. Okay. But let me do my best to give you just a, a, a big overview, 
Many are called, but a few are chosen. So there's two perspectives here. Number one is what we call the sovereignty of God, meaning God knows all. He is over all. He's in absolute control. There's not a list of things that God used to know. He's sovereign. Two, the free will of man, that we make decisions. Uh, These two are at play. So when a person chooses to follow Jesus, um, at least in my experience, it's it's a lot of men, I, I thought I chose Jesus, but then as I'm following him, I'm realizing that God has been pursuing me this whole time. He's been drawing me to himself. So who chose who? Decide. Right? Right? So th- this seems contradictory, but it's not. They're best friends. So let me do my best to give you the be- an illustration that I hope is helpful. So Mari and I, we are flying to Phoenix, Arizona next month. Okay? Um, the flight path for that flight was predetermined by the FAA. Agreed? Yes? Okay. (laughs) It was predetermined before I purchased the ticket for that flight. Agreed? Yes? Okay. Goodness. However, on the flight, uh, there are many choices that I will make. Am I going to read? Am I going to sleep? Am I going to drink? By the way, True or false, there are drinks you'll drink on an airplane that you'll never drink anywhere else. I never drink cran apple juice other than a plane. It's so odd. Um, Am I going to read? Am I going to watch a movie? Am I going to sleep? Am I going to stare? Am I going to eat? All these choices. But at the same time, I am following the predetermined flight to Phoenix. Okay. Um, So hear me. With this, many are called, few are chosen. We need to have a level of humility with this when trying to understand the mind of God. Right? The Bible is clear. Deuteronomy says there are mysteries of God that we just won't understand. If we understood everything about God, guess what? He ceases to be God. Right? So there's a humility there. So here's, here's where I've landed. I have two pillars. On this pillar, I do believe that God is absolutely sovereign. He is in control. Like the election isn't going to catch him off guard. On this pillar, we make choices and we are responsible for the choices we make. That is a tension, friends, that we in humility just have to be okay with my free will to choose and God's sovereign call in election. And so, for you theology nerds, a lot of the Calvinists, they are very hard on sovereignty of God. And the Arminians, they are very heavy on the free choice of man. What I tell people is I will preach like an Arminian and I will sleep like a Calvinist. I'll preach like, you need to make a decision. And I'll sleep like, God is sovereign. He's in control. Right? Um, so I hope that clarifies or maybe I've confused you even more. We're going to move on. Right? Verse 15 through 17, another part. Then the Pharisees, this is not a parable, this is real life now, went and plotted, here they go again, how to trap and tangle Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples, the Pharisees' disciples, along with the Herodians, saying, just, just see how they're buttering him up with this disgusting flattery. Teacher, we know that you are true. And you teach the way of God truthfully, and you don't care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay, so before we dig in, let's talk about the characters. We know the Pharisees, the religious Jewish leaders, the Herodians, these guys are Jewish people who are very politically inclined. But they are part of the Roman dynasty, the Herod family, hence Herodians. And these are political believers. It's all about politics, that voting for the right person and getting the right person in office, that will save everything. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Hear me. We are for sure encroaching on election season. Okay. 
Um, as we vote, and please do vote, vote for, it is important for you know, to know the issues and who you vote for and know the issues at play here. But hear me, at the end of the day, no matter how many dollars we spend, no matter how many wars we wage, no matter how many elections we have, no matter how many officials we elect into office, good or bad, at the end of the day, none of those things, none of those people will save. Amen. We got to know that it's in the season where people, they, they will never say it, but their political people have become almost functional Jesus, functional Savior. Like, you are the Savior of this world. And I'm like, no, that job description only applies to one person. His name is Jesus. So please vote. Be informed. And it is, it is important who we elect into office. But at the end of the day, Jesus, he is not caught off guard. He is still sitting on his throne. Amen. Because if God really thought the main issue were politics, he would have sent a politician. That's what the Jewish people were expecting. If God really thought the issue was the economy, he would have sent the best economist. But he knew the biggest issue is this big S word called sin. So he sent what? A savior. He sent a savior. So as, as we get into this season, as it gets so crazy and it's a big dumpster fire, this is where my belief that God is in control helps me sleep. That none of this is making him bat an eye. So the Pharisees, also you got to know this, hated the Herodians. Because the Herodians were agents of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire were the ones that are, that are oppressing the Jewish people. So the Pharisees hated the Herodians. The Herodians hated the Pharisees. Yet they got together because they both, what, hated Jesus. Tells you everything. It's amazing how Jesus can unite the haters in one room. Right? And here, here it goes. They, they start buttering him up. Teacher, we know you're true. We know you teach the truth. We know you got a spine of steel. We know the appearances and sway you. So tell me, tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They're using the sandwich method, right? Butter, butter, insult. And I get that too. Whenever I hear, hey, Pastor Frank, I, man, we've been listening to you online, and it's been awesome, and I'm just waiting for a, but you're a moron. Like, I'm, I'm just waiting for something, right? He says, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, or is it not? I love Jesus. Because he's God. Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, hey, whose likeness, whose image and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, okay, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, it says they marveled, they were amazed by his answer, and they just kind of left speechless, and they walked away, realizing they could not entangle him again. So some of you, right, the, the, the IRS is a fraudulent entity, right, which is not completely not true, and you shouldn't pay taxes. Right? And I'd say to you, we have a name for people like that. They're called in jail. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're called. But the Roman tax system, you got to hear me, it was a lot worse back then. During this time, it was a period called Pax Romana, which meant it was a time of peace. But they had to pay for that, police protection. But also, they were essentially paying their oppressors. Right? That they were paying the very people who were doing the oppressing to them. Right? So the Roman coin, the denarius, was a one day's wage for a soldier one side of it was Caesar's face. The other side was Caesar sitting seated with his flowing robes of justice. 
And so the Jews hated this for two reasons. Number one, they were paying to be oppressed. Number two, it was an idolatrous image on this coin. So Jesus' answer, aware of their malice, he says, hey, render to Caesar what's his, render to God what's his. And when they heard it again, they were amazed, they marveled, and they walked away. And the honest question is, what was so amazing about Jesus' answer that they marveled, shut their mouth, and had to walk away? What, What is so amazing? Here's why. Because if Jesus said, yes, it is lawful, pay your taxes to Caesar, pay your taxes, it would have turned all the common people, his followers, the Jewish people, the Pharisees against him because they were being oppressed by the dollars they were spending in taxes to pay the people that were oppressing them. However, if Jesus said, no, it's not lawful, don't pay your taxes, the Herodians, agents of the king, would see Jesus as a traitor And probably they'd have arrested Jesus way before he was arrested later. So there was a trap. They were trying to set Jesus in, and the trap, again, did not work. This is why Jesus' answer was so amazing, and it rendered them just astonished, and it rendered them ineffective, and they walked away. Instead, Jesus says, hey, let me see the coin. Who's the guy on the coin? They say, it's Caesar. Okay, give to him what belongs to him, give to God what belongs to God. This is why I love the Bible. Many scholars, and I agree with them, believe that the disciples of the Pharisees, the Jewish people, in what they were taught in the schooling they were brought up in, that their thoughts, when they heard Jesus' answer, their thoughts latched on to the word image in Jesus' question, whose image is on that coin? So the thinking, hear me, lean in, the breakdown of this would go something like this. Question, hey, if you're going to render to Caesar what bears his image, then what are you going to render to God? Answer, you render to God what bears his image. What bears the image of God? All of us. All of you. Your whole being. So hear me, it is right for a believer to pay taxes, okay? Read Romans 13 if you don't believe me. But hear me, just as it is right for Caesar to collect taxes, it is right for God to get our worship, our devotion, all of us. God wants all of you. Did you know that? He wants your hearts. He wants inward change. He doesn't just want outward profession. He wants inward transformation. He doesn't just want a contractual, formal, religious attachment with with no change, no affection, no covenant, just all contractual. He wants all of you. Because here's the truth. Your money, it's not yours. Your business, it's not yours. Parents, your children, they're not yours. Your spouse, they're not yours. Your future is not yours. And we live under the silly myth that we are somehow in control of our life. You're not. God is in absolute control. And he's saying, whatever bears my image, give to me. That's all of you. That's all of me. Does that make sense? Right? God wants all of you. And some of you, like the first parable, you're just too busy. You're just too busy. That, that's your answer to everything. I've just been busy. I've just been busy. It's been crazy. I've just been busy. I've just, well, you're, then you're too busy. You're too busy. Right? He wants all of you. And Jesus gave all of him to purchase all of you. Um, here's the bad news. You and I, we cannot achieve God's acceptance. However, here's the great news. You don't need to. You don't need to. The bad news is no matter how moral, no matter how nice and put together your garment is, 
no matter how devoted you are, the bad news is none of those things can get you God's acceptance. And the great news is that you don't have to. So let me take it all the way back to the first parable. Let me, let me try to tie the bow on this message. Okay. What the king in the parable did not do to the invitees coming in from the street with their messed up garments, what he did not do is tell them to go back home and change and bring your own garments to this feast. What he did not do is require them to clean up their garments. And once you've scrubbed all of that out, then you can come in. Rather, the king gave them brand new clothes that are clean, that are new. Amen. This is the beauty of the gospel. Religion will tell you, hey, change your clothes. Hey, clean up your clothes. Gospel says, hey, take off your clothes and take mine. Because mine are clean. Mine are spotless. Mine is perfect. This is the difference between religion and the gospel. And I just feel compelled to say for you ladies in the room, some men, but statistically mostly ladies in this room, statistically, um, one out of every four of you, you have been sexually abused, assaulted, molested. Okay. For you ladies that have been abused, I need you to hear this, please, from my heart. Is that the devil has been whispering or maybe yelling that you are damaged goods, that you are dirty, um, what man is going to want you after that? It is somehow your fault that that happened to you. I need you to hear that the king gives you his garment and his garment is clean, it's white, it's pure, it is spotless without blemish. That is why on your wedding day, you're going to wear a white dress because that is how God sees you. I need you to hear this. He loves you. And what's been done to you may explain you, but what Jesus did for you, that is what defines you. Okay. You're pure. You're clean. You're spotless. And don't let anybody, religious people, the devil, tell you otherwise. That's what the gospel does. This is also why I love weddings, because I see the bride in her pure white dress walking down the aisle. It just signifies the purity of the gospel, and that once you meet Jesus, and once you give your life to Jesus, you are clean. Not because you cleaned up your clothes, because you took yours off, and you put on the one that king gave you. Okay. Um, this parable, this earthly story, has a profound, profound heavenly truth. And let me tell you, it's the greatest truth. It is the gospel truth. Okay. Hear me, all of us, we come to the king with our hands empty, we don't come to the king with our hands full. All of us, we come broken. We come with our cracks. We come a little messed up. And if you don't think you fall in that category, your pride is prominent right now. You come with nothing to offer and what the king does not do, he doesn't require you to clean yourself up. 
This is religion. What the king does not do is to tell you to try harder, be better, run faster. Rather, what the king does, he sends his son to live a perfect, spotless, sinless life that you and I could not live, to die a brutal death on the cross in our place, a death that we should have died, rose again to give us salvation, a gift that we could not earn instead of our own righteousness that's not good enough. Instead, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. Amen. This is the gospel. There's, there's nothing else. This is the greatest news that he makes you clean. He makes you righteous. He makes you right with God. Nothing else. No one else. And it is from that relationship we live our lives for God. It goes from, I need to read the Bible because if I don't read the Bible, God's going to, no, no, no. You saved me. Ah, this is the book that you wrote. Awesome. I want to read this. I want to pray to you. I want to talk to my, see how that works. One is lifeless. One is full of life. Right? This is the best news ever, friends. I, I think they should play this on the nightly news every evening. Just to remind us, Jesus did all the work. You get all the benefits. Seems too good to be true. It is. That's why it's called grace. He loves you. Hear me, salvation is not achieved. Salvation, it is received. And hear me, you cannot lose what you've never achieved, and you cannot achieve something that is freely given. Do you know Jesus? We are saved by Jesus. We are sustained by Jesus, and our proverbial plane will get to its final destination because of Jesus. Amen. Right? So friends, I love you. And as you hear this message, Ben, you can come up now. I'm praying the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to all of you in the way that he knows that you need to be spoken to and where you are at in your life right now. Some of you, you are just simply too, too busy. And hear me, I said this last Sunday, it doesn't have to be sinful it's just foolish. It's just dumb. It's not helpful. And you, you've been doing this because your excuse has been, it's not a sin. I don't, I, don't, I don't see a verse for it. Well, that's not the standard. Is it just dumb? It's foolish. Or for some of you, it is sinful. And you've bought into this American church lie of you can live however you want because he'll forgive you. He will, but if God's forgiveness compels you to sin more, then I would submit maybe you have not met Jesus, the person. Okay. Um, and for some of you, you are operating out of your own self-righteousness. Like, like, um, like the gospel and this whole cross dying for your sins thing um, if you were brutally honest with yourself and you weren't in church um, you don't really need Jesus that, that cross is for like those those people there that, that did that crazy thing I've been a good moral person. I, I've never gotten drunk. I've never X, Y, Z. And you're living off of this self-righteous pride and it's disgusting. Right? You smell like a filthy rag that sat out for a while and that water is getting a little stinky. That's, that's what you smell like. Right? And you've been operating from my garment is good. So, the King Jesus, I appreciate your garment, but I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm okay. Um, and I want you to know you're not okay. You are the opposite of okay. You need the King's garment. You need 
to take off your garment and you need to put on the king's perfect, blameless, clean garment. Some of you, you have so much shame, okay? You have so much shame um, either because of what you've done or maybe what's been done to you. And your garment is so straggly and it's so battered up and it's so dirty that you've been invited, but there's so much shame that you won't even enter and you are outside the gate of the feast. For you, I would say, shame is not from the Lord. For you, I would tell you, uh, Jesus took all of your shame and he gives you his shameless garment. Because if we're honest, all of us, all of us, we don't have what it takes. All of us should be trembling outside the gate saying, ah, I don't, I, and, and we're, and there's some, there's some truth there that we are not worthy. We, we don't have what it takes. My, 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 it's not my good outweighed the bad so I can squeak in. No, we're all out there trembling and thank the Lord. The king comes and he says, take my garment. This is the scandalous nature of the gospel. So wherever you are in this camp, I pray the Holy Spirit would, would bring something to the forefront of your mind. Okay. What bad in your life needs to stop so good can start? What needs to come off your calendar? What are you sowing into? Not just what are you doing. Where are you sowing? Do your children know? Yeah, to mom and dad, it's clear. Jesus, man, that is the most important thing to them. So I hope there's a little bit of urgency. Um. For some of you, you're like, Frank, that's right. It, it, it's true. Like, God's been trying to wake me up to get my attention, but I've just been saying, I'm just too busy. I'll do it once. I'll do it once. I'll do it once. Okay. And here's the beauty of this. This is all coming from a place of a God, Jesus, who really does love you, and all of his kind of commands or quote-unquote rules, uh, it, it's not to suck joy. It's to actually give you true freedom in this life because he does love you. And our king, unlike every other king, uh, he's not dead. Amen? We don't have this, this theoretic hope. We don't have this, this dead hope that's in the ground that we go every year to put flowers on a dead guy. We don't have this... this this figurative hope. We have a living hope. His name is Jesus, and he's living, and he's active right now, and one day he will come to judge the living and the dead. Amen. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing to King Jesus. Father, thank you for these people. Um, Holy Spirit, my desires, we, we do not want to be the wedding crashers. We don't want to come at this thinking that we have what it takes, that we have the devotion it takes, we have the grit that it takes, but that we would all come humbly with arms empty, not arms full, that you would reignite a simple desperation for that old rugged cross once again. That the gospel truth, this simple gospel truth, that you would awaken the wonder in our soul, that it would amaze us again. That we came in with the wrong clothes and you didn't demand the right clothes, you didn't make us clean our dirty clothes, you gave us 
the clean clothes. I pray that that reality would amaze us again. And we wouldn't compartmentalize the gospel for the messed up ones, but I'm not as messed up, so I think I'm not as desperate as they are. No, we are all desperate because apart from you, we cannot do nothing. Apart from you, we all end up in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. But thank you for your righteousness. Thank you that you became sin and you knew no sin so that we in you may become the righteousness of you. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you that we sing to, we worship, we adhere, we follow, not an idea that we don't have to go to a holy place, but that we go to a very living person. Thank you, Jesus, that you are not dead, that you are alive and well. And you are patient. And you will continue to pursue your people. To invite us into this life-giving relationship with you. That is contingent not on what we do, but on what you already did. And we do everything we do compelled from what you've already done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you. We worship you, King Jesus. And we pray this in your mighty name. All of God's people said, amen. Let's stand, let's sing.